Hello again. This presentation is about farm management economics and its role in modelling the improvement of beef production systems in Northern Australia. The authors are Fred Chudley and Dr Marie Bowen from the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries Queensland. So this is part of a project that we're doing under the Drought and Climate Adaptation Program. The project is about delivering integrated production and economic knowledge and skills. The aim is to help industry prepare for, respond to, recover from drought. It's all about improved knowledge and skills in that, in that area. And the main thing we're going to look at today is providing a decision-making framework and tools. So therefore it's about how, what the decision-making framework and tools are that we apply. And the decision-making framework is about economics. So decision-making is about making choices. Choices are in the future and the discipline for assessing choices is economics. So the decision-making framework has got, is about economics. The economic principles that need to be considered in this decision-making framework. So to assess decisions you will need to apply empirical information, information that's correctly gathered, to basic principles of production and economics. So what are the basic principles of production and economics that your information has got to be applied within? So things like diminishing marginal returns, comparative advantage, size, fixed and variable costs, opportunity costs, inventory income, Equimarginal returns, cash and profit, gearing and growth, risk, valuation of benefits and costs, and time. Well, there's a short list, but there's more than that. So these go into the topic we call farm management economics. Farm management economics combines empirical information with the principles of production and economics. It's a logical framework to consider choices and make conclusions about the potential contribution that alternative actions can make to achieving goals. So it's not necessarily about profit. Economics is about choices and goals. Yes, for those of you who are trained in the sciences, it is probably rocket science, something completely different to the way you normally think. So the terminology, theory and way of thinking are different when you're applying economics to when you're going about the normal science approach to solving problems. When we think about far, the role of farm management economics, it must be in the framework to effectively model the improvement of beef production systems. All of the strategies we consider throughout the project, which is our DCAP project, are analysed within that framework. So let's let's go back to the start. Let's let's think about where we start with this farm management economics and it's about profit but what we say is that to stay in the game of beef production they need to produce a profit so over time they need to produce a profit which will build their capital and equity and wealth that's how they stay in the game it, it provides a buffer this producing a profit so the way we think about that is is no matter what sort of beef production system you have at the start of any production period, and that might be the next 12 months or it might be the next decade, you have a series of assets or cap an amount of capital that you can apply as a resource to produce beef. Now that opening assets can be made up of your equity, the amount of capital that you have in your name and somebody else's uh, capital that we can call debt, but it could be in other forms. So that that opening assets are applied to produce revenue. Now, that, when we're looking at profit, that revenue can be cash and non-cash. We'll look at that in a moment. Out of that total enterprise revenue, we take out the costs that vary with the amount of production, which we call variable costs. That gives us a thing called a total gross margin. Now, out of the total farm gross margin, we take out fixed costs, things like the operating overheads of the property or the beef production system um, and an allowance for what the owners should be paid as a fair recompense for the labour they put into producing the beef 
Um, that gives us a thing called operating profit. Now that operating profit is the return to the total assets employed in producing uh, that, that beef. And when you, when you say, right, if that's the return to the total assets, let's take out the payment made for the use of other people's capital, which could be interest or rent or lease payment or something like that. When we take that out, we get net profit. Now, net profit is the return to your equity in the business. So that's the operating profit, net profit. Now, sometimes we have to adjust net profit to work out what the impact um, of that net profit is on your closing equity. So net profit is basically what you've made out of the business to keep for yourself. But sometimes you have to adjust that for the amount of tax that is paid or net consumption by the uh, operators of the business uh, above and beyond what we allow for here in owner's wages. So sometimes that can be a smaller amount and we call that the growth in the total assets. So then we can take that growth and say that's what we've contributed to the closing assets in terms of the profit we've generated out of this production system. Now of course uh, some, we hope that this total um, closing asset is greater in amount than the opening assets. Just in this diagram we haven't stretched it up there to allow for the growth but that's, that's how it works. So we've had to introduce a term called gross margin which is Revenue minus variable costs. We've introduced a profit term there and another profit term there. And the key thing to note here is the link between profit, what you produce above and beyond all the costs you incur, and assets and equity. So profit contributes to your the buffer that you can use to cope with the variability of beef production in Northern Australia. Let's go on and think about the first box that we got to there, gross margins. These are a limited tool and they're limited by the misuse that, they, that, that, they've, that has occurred in their use over time. So due to the misuse when analysing change in the northern beef industry, a better term is to use is gross delusions because they've been misused. Gross margins, the problem with gross margins is they do not include the implementation phase or the extra capital for, for most things that we want to look at in the beef industry improve our efficiency take time to implement and take extra capital they do a poor job of allocating operating overheads remember none of the fixed costs were included in the calculation of the gross margin and unpaid labor so that's a couple of issues with gross margins and the thing to remember here is most strategies to beef the improve the beef production system takes time to implement, requires extra capital or labour, can change the riskiness of the production system. This makes gross margins of limited use when you're looking at change. Gross margins are best used to compare an alternative use of the same resource that occurs in a very limited and discrete time frame where nothing other than the variable costs are likely to change. So that limits their use to choices for the same paddock in the near term future. But they are very useful as a building block and a more comprehensive analysis. And when you're doing livestock gross margins, the important thing to remember is they need to include a schedule. So let's look at this livestock schedule here on the left. We've got a livestock trading schedule on the right. We've got a gross margin and you can see in our livestock trading schedule, we've got part A and part B. In part A, we identify the opening number of stock, anything that's come into the, the um, livestock trading schedule during the year. So we've purchased some, we've had some births. That gives us a, a, a total there of, the op of part A. And in part B, it's all about what went out of our livestock enterprise. So we've had some sales, We've had some deaths and closing stock. So closing stock is what we had on hand at the end of the period. This is a fairly simple livestock trading schedule. That can be a lot more complex than this. And you can see here, this livestock trading schedule rec reconciles because uh, part A, the total of part A and the, part of, the total of part B are the same. And that was um, made to reconcile by adjusting the deaths until we thought we had the right number of deaths to make it reconcile. 
You can also have things like rations or transfers in, number unaccounted for. So if you've got a, a mustering efficiency of about 80%, you could have a fair number of cattle in there that you know are still in the paddock, but you can't. they didn't come through the yard, so you didn't count for them. So the livestock trading schedule recon, reconciles. It takes into account opening and closing stock. It takes into account uh, purchases, births, deaths, rations and sales. And you can see over here we value the opening stock. We put a, a market value or a, a trading value or a property value on our opening stock. We've costed the purchases. We haven't costed the births uh, in this uh, live tra trading schedule. But you can notice here in the closing stock, anything that was born that wasn't sold is included in the closing value. So the part of the value of the births is captured in there. Our sales... Our trading profit or loss is the total of B minus the total of A, which gives us 667000 So a positive sum equals a profit, a negative sum equals a loss. That trading profit or loss is transferred into our gross margin as a livestock trading profit or loss. And we can add in a few other things if there's other things in that, in that livestock gross margin to give us a gross income for that livestock enterprise. We take away our variable expenses, the costs that change with one more head, one less head, which gives us an enterprise gross margin. Now, sometimes we like to look at the gross margin less interest on herd capital. Now, so this, this is a useful way of accounting for the opportunity cost of the herd capital tied up in our livestock enterprise. So we take the average of the opening and closing value and put it over here and we say, righto, we could invest the money that we've got tied up in cattle somewhere else at 5%. We charge an opportunity cost of 5%. We take off $107,000 and come up with a livestock gross margin less interest on herd capital of $335,000. That is interesting when you are comparing different herd structures for the same property because you, you could have different amounts of capital tied up in the herd structure. So the, 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 note, the, the things to note here are the difference between livestock trading profit and livestock sales. So there's our livestock sales and our livestock trading profit is a different amount because we've taken into account the, the inventory change, the value change in the inventory of livestock, amongst other things. Is it possible to achieve a positive gross margin and not sell any cattle? So if you didn't sell any cattle here, could you achieve a positive gross margin? Well, obviously, yes, you could. You've got births and things coming in, and you could revalue your closing number to get a positive number here, which is greater than your variable expenses, so you could still get a positive gross margin without selling any cattle. So this structure of a livestock trading schedule that reconciles and a livestock gross margin that takes into account variable costs is the core component of any competent herd model. Those things are key in herd models. Let's look at livestock trading schedules and adult equivalents. So when you've got a herd with uh, numbers coming and going during the year, it's, it's important sometimes to recognise the grazing pressure applied by that herd and we do that by counting what we call adult equivalents for that herd. This is a way of maintaining the same grazing pressure or measuring the grazing pressure applied throughout analysis where we're looking at herd structural change over time. So we, we can't cheat by having more cattle running on the same property applying a higher grazing pressure unless that's what we want to look at. So we use adult equivalents to measure or maintain the same grazing pressure over time. There's three different ways that we uh, can apply these, this tool called adult equivalents. Uh, one is by uh, a linear AE calculation, as in applied in the Breakout Dynamic Suite of programs, where things are a proportion of a standard weight. Um, the met metabolic AEs, as applied in models like GRASP, where you've got a starting weight um, plus a starting weight plus a weight gain for a period, divided by 2 to the power of 0.75 to over the power. Now, sometimes people use a standard reference weight there of 450 kilos. I've just put 455 in there. Um, it does make a, a 
two decimal points different, but no, it's not that important. Um, you just that's the pa metabolic weight. Now the other method is quick intake, which is a spreadsheet developed by uh, Stu McLennan and Poppy over many years, and it's it's a, a much more complex tool, but it. Uh, is the better tool when you when you're looking at more complex things. So, linear AEs and metabolic AEs are suited to modelling alternative beef production strategies for the same property, where the nutrition does not change that much, and the average body weight of the overall herd is somewhere around about that 400 500 kilos. So, where you've got systems where the nutrition is significantly changed, like you're going to invest in lacina or oats or stylos or something where you completely change the nutrition of the animals um, or different breeds or significantly different growth rates are being modelled as alternative management strategies, then it's better to go to quink intake and get some help when you're estimating AEs because uh, these are fairly... Linear AEs and metabolic AEs are a fairly uh, sim simple tool to apply, uh, but they have their limits... And, and it's nice to, uh, you know, you get a pretty um, reasonable answer and similar answer with a similar ranking of strategies where you've, you're looking at the same property, the nutrition doesn't change much and your herd is it's, uh, typical of the northern Australia. Where you're doing something completely different in terms of nutrition or breeds or different growth rates, then you need to get hold of quick intake and you need to go that way. So, alternative herd structures based on any adult equivalent calculator, it doesn't matter what it is, or calculation process, always needs to pass a pub test of believability. So, you've got to ask yourself, when you've got these herd models and you've got different herd models on the same property or different herd structures, you've got to say, will that paddock or that property run those cattle and achieve that level of output performance? So, you rely on an experienced manager of the property or somebody who knows the property or the production system to say, if I make this change in age of turnoff, if I make this change in nutrition, if I make this change, is it believable that I can get that performance out of those cattle on that pasture? So it's always got to pass the pub test, no matter what way you're calculating adult equivalents. Let's go on and go back to this idea of the gross margins, and let's look at an example of how a gross margin might be applied. So in this case, we're looking at production feeding of light steers. And we're not looking at the whole gross margin. We're just looking at the results of it. Over on this side, we've got the results for an individual animal per animal. And over on this side, we've got for the mob. So we're saying into this production feeding system, we set it up as a separate little enterprise where we value the stock into the feeding system um, because we can choose to sell them or put them on the feeding system. We take off our purchase induction and variable costs of the feeding system and then we can also allow for the interest on the amount of capital we've got tied up in the cattle. So we've got the net value of the cattle sold. We've got the purchase induction and variable costs as summary. We've got and we've added interest to the purchase induction and variable costs. That gives us a gross margin per beast. That gives us also a gross margin per adult equivalent. Now, if you've looked at any of our previous presentations, you'll see that the one that we say is the best yardstick is gross margin, dollars per AE after interest. So dollars per unit of grazing intake applied after you've allowed for the capital tied up in the livestock in this little production feeding enterprise. And that comes to $442. So that's pretty good. Over here, when we look at the mob exercise, you say the total gross margin after interest, $100,000. If I go ahead and, and on the figures that are here in front of me, go ahead with this production feeding of light steers, I make a $100,000 profit. So... That looks okay, but what are the opportunity costs? If I didn't production feed the light steers, what opportunity could I take up? If I do production feeding the light, production feed the light steers, what opportunity am I foregoing? And here is the opportunity that we forewent, which is not production feeding the light steers. So when we look at that, we say, right, oh, the net value, if we follow that through and do the gross margin on valuing the cattle in and the costs of holding them and feeding them, uh, the net value of cattle sold, and we come down here, the gross margin per AE after interest, well, it's still positive, and we look over here and say, well, for that mob, we've now got $222,345. Well, if you remember previously, 
uh, we were looking at for at 97,000. So, oh, well, 222 is higher. It must be better. Well, no, the yardstick is gross margin dollar per AE after interest. 435 here. Previously, 442. They're about the same. So, no wars, you're no worse off leaving the steers on grass and looking after them. This extra amount here is because we left them on grass for a lot longer, but we've taken the cost of holding them for that longer period of time into this calculation here. And note, you must identify the opportunity cost of the alternative actions and make sure the data is okay. Very important when you're looking at little technologies like production feeding of steers, short, discrete ways of using the same resources over a period of time, different options, that's where we can use a gross margin to quickly look at it. So let's continue on and say, well, let's, let's, ex let, let's look at a different gross margin example, and it's still production feeding the steer tail, but in this case, we've got more accurate data. So in the previous case, the data of, for the costs, the values, the response functions were all estimated pretty roughly. Um, as best as we could get. But this one, we've sat down with some people who know the science and know the response, and we've said, what do we get out of production feeding of steers? And you can see, suddenly, when we look at a, a little break-even analysis here of where we value what we could get for these steers at the sale yards into this feeding exercise, so their value at the sale yards is that their value into the pen when we take off all their selling expenses and their transport expenses is $2.00. And we predict for these steers we could get $2.40 at the end of the period. So $2.40 in, $2.40 out. And we're losing about $90 ahead on the production feeding exercise. Um, it's The sensitivity analysis shows us that we've got to probably make between what we could get for them at the yards now and what we could get for, need to get for them at the yards after we've finished the production feeding, we probably need close to 40 cents a kilo change in the value of these steers to make a profit. It's fairly regular across a lot of price ranges for production feeding. You need to significantly change the value of the steers at the sale yards, their value prior to feeding to their value after feeding to make a profit. So what have we got here? We've got accurate measurement of costs. We've got a good production feeding response. We understand when we give this supplement to these steers, this is how much weight they're going to put on. And we've got a very good understanding of the market prices. And that provides a different insight into the value of production feeding. Accurate data being one of the key things there. So gross margins in summary. What is required to make livestock gross margins usable when analysing beef production systems? Obviously, accurate data for cost production responses and market prices. The right framework, having the right indicators, an understanding of the limitations of the tool, inclusion of the opportunity cost way of thinking. Opportunity cost. Let's go back and revisit that question. The opportunity cost of anything of value is what you have to give up in order to get it. A very general definition of opportunity cost, but it's something you have to give up in order to give what you want, get what you want. This has proven to be a difficult concept for people to grasp. So, you can understand that if you go to the American Economic Association, and you ask 200 delegates what is an opportunity cost, you'd think you'd get a fairly good answer. But a survey of delegates at the American Economic Association, most of whom would have been economists, showed that only 22% were able to correctly identify the opportunity cost of a decision. So it's not an easy concept to grasp, but it's critically important in looking at changing the way we improve or change beef production systems. Let's go on and do profit. The next step up from gross margins was profit. Measuring profit is the only way to measure efficiency. The sort of sums that we were doing, we had our revenue where we had our trading profit or loss and we took off our enterprise gross margin. We came up with our, uh, sorry, our enterprise variable expenses. We came up with our enterprise gross margin. Then we can take off our fixed expenses or our operating overheads, the things that don't change in the short term as we change production level. 
plant ma machinery depreciation allowance. It comes out of our profit operator's allowance for what we should be paid as a person to manage that beef production system. That gives our operating profit, which is our return on total assets invested. If we take out the amount of money that we've paid for the use of other people's capital, things like interest, leases, rents paid, in this case it was $63,000, gives us our net profit. So that's the standard way of measuring profit, operating profit, net profit, gross margin, operate allowance, enterprise output, all these things have been defined for long years about how you calculate them. Um, so there's a standard way of doing that. Now, the thing about a profit analysis is usually it's calculated for last year. It's therefore historical and has little direct use when modeling choices about what to do in the future. So you can analyze last year's profit, but it doesn't tell you much about where to go from here. It gives you some data. It can be used to think about how resources have been applied, and it also can be used to get a handle on numbers when building a plan. So some of these costs, operator's allowance, the variable expenses, things like that are very handy when you're looking forward. Note, a profit analysis can include unpaid expenses, as well as changes in inventory values and proceeds receivable. So profit is not cash. Let's extend our profit analysis to an investment analysis using discounted cash flow. So our profit analysis is a short analysis of what we did last year or over a period of time in the history. Our investment analysis is looking forward and the tool we're going to apply to look at our investment analysis is a thing called discounted cash flow. Now, uh, any of you who have looked at our Fitzroy uh, analysis will know in that we developed a region property, a regional property model where we started with an investment in land, plant and equipment and capital. So we costed that investment in year naught and it came up at somewhere between uh, over $7 million invested in our, in our property and in subsequent years it generated income of different amounts. As you can see, we, we did it as expected income and expenses, so it's all about the same. And then at the end of the 30-year period, we sold it all up, the residual cattle, the final value of the plant and equipment we had left, and the land value, and in, in real terms, so it was the land value was the same dollars per hectare as a start, so everything was done without taking any uh, real increase in land value account or inflation into account. So we laid that out over 30 years. So the, the discounted cash flow analysis includes opening and closing capital. It includes capital expenditure, not depreciation, so it's different to our profit analysis. It includes operator's allowance, livestock schedule, doesn't include depreciation. So there's a few rules about discounted cash flow analysis to make it uh, a reasonable thing to apply. And when we... Um, apply discounted cash flow analysis, we come up with a thing called net present value uh, and internal rate of return. Now we'll look at those in a little bit of detail. And we have a thing called a discount rate. So a discount rate in this case is the opportunity costs of the funds that we have invested that we've chosen to assess the value of the investment in this property in the Fitzroy region. So we're saying we could take our initial investment and put it somewhere else at 5% long term and when you compare that investment at 5%, that for those funds invested at 5% compared to the funds invested in our prob uh, property, the net present value is minus $3.6 million or minus 3.7. So that means we would have been $3.7 million better off to invest it somewhere else at 5%. Our internal rate of return, the, the rate of return on the funds invested in that property is calculated at 1.71%. So when the internal rate of return is lower than the discount rate, you get a negative net present value. Let's think about that and think about this framework. So this property, it's an investment of resources over time to achieve the goals of the investor. The time preference of money the opportunity cost of money, so the time preference of money, which is a thing that uh, applies in this analysis, makes it difficult to compare money values received at different points in time. So if I offered you 
um, an amount in year 10 or an amount now, you'd say, well, year 10 is a bit uncertain, I'll take the money now. So time preference of money, people prefer income certainty about receipt of money and if they don't have certainty, they put an opportunity cost on it. We used 5%. And that makes it difficult to compare money values received at different points in time. So to compare and aggregate money values over time, it is first necessary to discount them to their present value equivalent. So you could compound everything put forward and have a future value. But in this case, we discount all of these different amounts back to the common starting point and we discount them to their present value equipment which is the net present value in this case so discounting is used to evaluate the profitability of investment whose life extends over a number of years it is also used when selecting among investments with different cash flow patterns that's where we use discounting to take into account the time preference for money where we've got years and time and different cash flow patterns involved. Looking at the expected return on total investment is interesting. So, okay, 1.71%. That's interesting. Doesn't tell us much. Our goal in all of the project work is to see whether we can make the beef production system more efficient, not sell it. So this is interesting stuff, but it doesn't really inform us of where we want to go. It's all about the future. So it's all about how do we change our investment strategy, our management strategy, to be more efficient in the future? Let's just go back and do a bit of rocket science definition of these terms that we've just introduced. So we've got this net present value term. We define that formally as the difference between the present value of all benefits and the present value of all costs of an investment with the present value of benefits and cost calculating using a particular discount rate. So we took the present value of all the benefits and the present value of all the costs and we discounted them at 5% and we got a net present value there. The internal rate of return, another bit of rocket science, is the discount rate at which the present value of the future benefits equals the present value of total costs. So at what discount rate does all these future benefits equal the present value of that cost there? And it's 1.71%. That's the discount rate that makes the present value of future benefits equal to the present value of total costs. Now, to test the understanding of that two definitions, what would be the net present value if the internal rate of return was 5%? So if we'd achieved an internal rate of return there of exactly 5%, what would our net present value be? So in looking at these definitions, we can see that the net present value would be zero because our internal rate of return and our discount rate are the same. So there's no difference between the investments. I can choose to put the property, uh, the investment into the property. And I, if I generated 5% there, I would be no different to putting it somewhere else at 5% and earning 5%. Let's just build a little bit of depth into that. So let's do a quick net present value and internal rate of return example. So it's a net present value choice for the man in the street, not for the beef producer. So you have some spare cash, 10 grand, that you would like to invest. Is it better to place it in a savings account and earn 2.5% each year over the next decade? Or place it in a fund that will return $2,500 in year three $1,000 in year 7 and $12,000 in year 10. So 2.5%, $250, or place it in a fund that will get you three discrete amounts. So to compare and aggregate money values over time, it is first necessary to discount them to their present value. So we've got different flows over time. We need to bring them back to a common point in time. The savings account earns 2.5%, so we can use that as the opportunity cost of the alternative investment. So that's what we have to give up, 2.5%, to take on to achieve the alternative investment. Let's do a quick graph here. So the investment A, uh, we invest our $10,000 and we get our interest that we take out each year 
and at the in year 10 we get back our $10,000 plus that year's interest our investment B we put the same $10,000 into an alternative investment and we get money there money there and money at the end so investment A has a return of 2.5% this is the internal rate of return at a discount rate of 2.5% investment B has a positive net present value of 2475 that means the in, in return is greater than 2.5% so investment B also has an internal rate of return of 5.3% almost double the rate of return on the fixed interest which investment would you select so would you in, select A or B why and normally the why you would select a different investment is to do with your perception of the riskiness of the alternatives and we'll look at that a bit later to compare and aggregate money values over time it is first necessary to discount them to their present values so we discounted each of these money values over time back to year zero and we said that's how we can compare them very hard to compare them any other way let's go back to our Fitzroy regional herd model um, and let's think about using discounted cash flow to consider change and in this case we're going to develop Lakina on the base property to turn our steers off so we do the same thing we start with the same investment land plant and capital and then we invest in Lakina so there's a little bit of a cash inflow there where we sell down some cattle to open up some paddock space for plant Lakina and then we've got our um, expected incomes over time and at the end of the 30 year period we sell land plant equipment to capture all the benefits we've uh, accumulated over time and in this case at the same discount rate we've got a three million dollar net present value internal rate of return of 2.38 percent bit hard to know much about what's going on there so looking at a changed investment strategy such as Lakina in this case as an alternative discrete whole farm investment does not tell you much it is necessary to look at the marginal costs and returns over time to understand the impact to change so the what costs the marginal costs marginal costs are the extra cost incurred in growing or selling an additional unit of product they are definitely not the average cost so the marginal cost is what we've got to look at so when how do we do that so we take it up to the next level which is what we call a partial discounted cash flow analysis which is looking at the difference between alternative investments for a property so we've got the Fitzroy region um, model with Lakina and we say okay that's uh, one option and we've got the Fitzroy region property just continuing on without Lakina investment and we look at the difference between the two so one possible future minus another possible future equals the marginal analysis this is our marginal analysis over here the key concepts applied in this are opportunity cost time value of money and the principle of marginality investments need to have a consistent time horizon be not mutually exclusive and have the same investment outlay when we're looking at this for our beef properties so we've got the same investment outlay in both cases and then we change after that and we've got the same time horizon 30 years in each case and they're not mutually exclusive these are the marginal costs and benefits calculated at the property level so here's the difference between the two that's what we're looking for so a question here what are the opportunity costs of investing in Lakina so one opportunity cost one thing foregone is continuing the property as it was another opportunity cost could be the extra capital that we've got to tie up here in developing the Kina another opportunity cost for some people could be that they need to spend more time managing the Lakina paddocks uh, and that could be costed in as well as an opportunity cost when we're looking at the difference between these two so the we need to calculate the return on extra capital so it's not on total capital we need to look at the return on the extra capital that we've got tied up so in this case in the first year we sell down a few cattle we generate a little bit of extra income but then we plant the lacina and we forego some income uh, that's the extra capital tied up here and then we generate benefits so what's the return 
on the extra capital. And again, we can just apply the same net present value to the extra capital and internal rate of return calculation to this whole investment to get the return on extra capital. So the net present value is $620,000. So it's saying if we go ahead with this investment, we are in effect adding the equivalent of $620,000 to our present wealth. So it's all discounted back to this starting point here. And the internal rate of return on the extra capital invested is about 33%. So that tells us a little bit more about the investment. When we look at the difference, when we look at the marginal return or the return on extra capital. So some people don't understand that or don't get a real good hold on that idea of the net present value. So what we do is we convert the net present value to an annualized return or an amortized return. How do we do that? Uh, the annualized return is just a different way of communicating the benefits of change. It has a, an identical value to the net present value. So at the, at the discount rate of 5%, our net present value is $620,000. We amortize that at the same discount rate over the 30-year investment and say the amortized value, the annual value of the, discount, of the net present value is about $40,000. Now, this value amortized NPV is not the same as the average annual difference in operating profit. It's probably a lesser amount, but it is close enough not to worry most people. So we say this is roughly on average the impact on your annual profit of investing in Lakina. And of course, it's not on average because you just saw the graph of it going up and down, but it's an indication, um, a rough approximation of the impact on profit. There's other things going on in the background in this investment, and we've got to think about the risks. So this is just a snapshot of the risks that we produce at the same time. Um, there's a lot more detail that goes into the planning of these changes once you uh, have looked at them initially. But So it, one of the initial things we look at is just this snapshot. So the things we look at are peak deficit, year of peak deficit, and payback period. Uh, this is a, a, a printout from our spreadsheet where we do uh, these analysis where we compare the two. So the total improvement change versus do nothing. So this is the difference between the change and the do nothing. You see in the first year, we generate that extra income from stock sales. And then we spend all our money on the Lakina investment. Uh, then we spend a bit more and a bit more, and then we start to generate a positive difference. Now the cumulative difference compounded is what we're interested in. So in the first year, we accumulate that then in the next year, we've got we've spent 208, so that minus that gives us 73, plus a bit of interest on that. Um, so we're accumulating that. In the next year, we've spent another 50, that's minus, and then we spent another 12, that's minus 145. And then next year, we get plus 28. So this is our peak deficit. How much extra, including interest, do we have to outlay? So that's the difference between the system that we could have which is without Lakina, and the system with Lakina. So that's roughly what the impact on your overdraft might be or the extra capital and cash that you've got to outlay over time to get into Lakina. And it's not that amount because we've generated a positive there. So this is the peak deficit for our uh, investment analysis. And we're interested in how many years before the negatives don't get any larger. So it's one, two, three, four years before we get to the peak deficit. We've still, and we've still got a, a, an ongoing deficit here. And then how many years before we get back to where we would have been. So uh, if we'd have just gone ahead and had our normal overdraft with the property without Lakina, and we go and invest in Lakina, it's this year here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about seven years before we get back our overdraft to where we would have been. And remembering there's, it's compounded, so there's an allowance for interest in there. So there, a snapshot of some of the risks involved in investment that we're looking at. Why 30 years? We said we've got to have a consistent period of time for all our analyses. We've found that a lot of the things that we can do in the northern beef industry take a long time to implement uh, and 
a lot of them have an effective economic life of, of about 30 years. So when we're looking at Lakina or fencing and waters or strategies like pasture improvement, the effective life is 30 years. Now, if you go much past 30 years, your 5% discount rate will have a very big impact on any benefits past 30 years. So 30 years we chose to be consistent with our investment period across all strategies, um, but it's a useful time period for the economic life for a lot of these investments. If different ways of running a particular system are to be compared, the initial measuring stick is the expected extra return on any extra capital invested to change. One of the key rules of what we're doing, or what anybody should be doing, in looking at running a beef production system a different way. It's extra return on extra capital. So when we've done a lot of those analyses for different strategies, we come up with this sort of table. And uh, these are available for down, this one isn't available yet, but it will be soon from our uh, page on the Future Beef site. And you can see we, we look at uh, different strategies and we say we've got our annualized NPV, we've got our peak deficit with interest, a year of peak deficit, our payback period and our internal rate of return for each strategy we look at. This is just a subset of the strategies we've looked for the Mitchell Grass Northern Downs analysis. And you can see we've looked at things like going from turning off weaner steers to an older age of turn off the steers, putting hormonal growth promotants into the steers, um, feeding a molasses production mix, optimising the cow culling age, first mating heifers as yearlings, uh, supplementing those first calf heifers to try and get a better reconception rate, uh, genetic improvement of the weaning rate through selecting, uh, identifying bulls that will give you a better weaning rate through genetic potential, home, home breeding your own bulls and selecting them uh, objectively and reducing fetal calf loss or, or converting from breeding to steer trading. So when we, we um, look at this, the power of the, this partial discounted cash flow analysis is its capacity to compare the relative value of, of a, a range of alternative investments for the same property over time. So it, it takes a little bit of effort to put all these together, but you can quickly look down them and say, well, these red negatives, I'm probably not going to be very much interested in them, but some of these positives, well, I've, I've got to think about them. So it's a way of just ranking, quickly ranking, looking, and then looking at the risks associated. So we can say things like, if your breeder herd on this northern Mitchell Grass Downs, sort of in your Julia Creek, Cloncurry type country, um, if you start with steer, uh, steer wiener production, your cows are producing and selling wiener steers, you can improve the profitability of that property by about $70,000 per annum if you change to an older age of turnoff. And we've, in this case, we've said 31 months. And we're, but we're saying there, to get from producing weaner steers, you've got to retain steers and sell down some cows. And that will give you a, a deficit in your bank account that you've got to deal with while you're waiting for those steers to get older. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, if you're turning off your steers at 31 months old already and you decide, well, look, I'm going to get rid of all the breeders and just go steer, grow, grow steers, we go and buy weaner steers and keep them until they're 31 months old, that is more profitable on average than the breeding operation. But the trouble um, with that is you've got to get from the breeding operation to the steer trading operation and there's a very significant deficit there that you've got to overcome uh, to get from one system to the other. So you might say, oh, that's more profitable, I'll do that. But then you've got to realise there's, there's risk, price risk involved, plus you've got to get out of the cows, into the steers, selling down the cows and buying the steers creates a significant deficit that you've got to manage. Now, we have a project page where a lot of these things can be viewed. Um, we've got some products and spreadsheets, they're all available on, our, on Future Beef at this project page. When you get there you'll find uh, Future Beef and Improving Profitability and Resilience of Beef and Sheep Businesses. Uh, it's a work in progress, there's quite a bit there. We've got our Fitzroy Beef Production Systems Analysis up there. We've got our Central West Mitchell Grass Lands Analysis up there and we've got Northern Gulf up there. We haven't got the Northern Downs yet uh, but hopefully um, that will be up there in the near future. 
We've also got a series of presentations and example spreadsheets to look at short-term response and recovery things. They demonstrate uh, some, some simple options that you can compare. We've got some drought response where we've got seven presentations. Things like, do I sell a gist or feed? If I sell, what do I sell first? Does re my response now, if what do I sell now? If I sell them, does that determine how well I can recover when it rains? And then we've got drought recovery. We've got two presentations there that look at the most efficient way of rebuilding herd structure. We look at uh, things like purchasing cows and calves or taking cattle on adjustment or purchasing trading cattle, uh, repurchasing the components of the herd. So there's a lot of stuff on there uh, where we look at drought recovery, drought response, and, the, and you can load the spreadsheets up and follow the presentations. Let's go back and have a look at cash flow. Cash flow, uh, we haven't mentioned so far, it's been all about profit, but the cash flow is the other side of the equation. Um, cash flow is normally you've got cash in the bank, you've got inflows, which can be selling down your inventory, capital sales, anything that comes in as cash. You've got cash outflows, and, and we can calculate a thing called cash flow before principal and interest, and then we take out the principal and interest, which is repayments to the lenders. Net cash flow, that's, in, that's an important measure for your bank manager. Take out any tank, tax, and that'll be the change in the bank balance. So that's simply a cash flow. Cash flow analysis, as you would realise by now, does not equal profit analysis. Does not assess, assess efficiency. It's mainly used to consider whether the production system can pay its bills in the short term. There's two separate questions to consider. Does it pay, which is our profit analysis? Can I afford it, which is our cash flow analysis? This is economic analysis, this is financial analysis. Both are necessary. We've fo focused on the profit analysis because you've got to work out, does it pay, Because you, before you can have a look at, can I afford it? Both are necessary. So let's just summarise this. Modelling the improvement of beef production systems in Northern Australia. That's what the topic has been. What does it take to do that? We need accurate data for cost, production responses and market prices. We need to apply the right framework. We have to have an understanding of the limitations of the tools. We have to include things like opportunity costs, time value of money, taking a marginal perspective, all those economic things that we need to think about. That is, the basic principles of production and economics must be applied. You've got to have both. It therefore is a team effort. The economists can't do this by themselves. The production people can't do this by themselves. You need both. Thank you.